me and I'm, I'm the CEO of Hum and one of the co-founders and I'm Andy and I'm the head of engineering here at Hum. Uh, I'm Mark Miller and I'm the COO and CTO of Hum. I'm Bree Cahill and I'm the director of community and partnerships. I'm Josephine and I'm an intern at Hum. And hi, I'm Carla. I'm the head of marketing and customer experience at Hum. Well, welcome everybody. Today is time for Hum Book Club. Oh, we can't see that, but it's <laughs> Train Your Mind, Change Your Brain by Sharon Begley. Uh, like I said, I think we're going to have a pretty short conversation and a lot of the questions were inspired by the book, but aren't necessarily specifically about things in the book. There was uh, a lot there. This book came out in 2007. Obviously, science doesn't stop when a book gets published. And I'm really curious about things that you've seen happen in neuroscience since the publication of this book that maybe or maybe not would change your perceptions of the things that she shared in the book. Well, Carla, I'll tell you, I'll ante in with a couple. Uh, so since 2007, it's actually been a period of almost explosive growth in the expanse of neuroscience research and discoveries. Just some remarkable things have been going on. Uh, just to mention a few, uh, you know, just in neural implants alone, uh, the, the idea of being able to do both sensing and neurostimulation when in direct contact with the brain. Uh, you know, this started back in the 80s with things like cochlear implants for uh, people who were uh, auditorily challenged. But now it looks like there's actually real prospect for the creation of retinal implants and restoring vision to the blind. Um, you know, the, the use of deep brain stimulators for things like Parkinson's disease, vagus nerve stimulation, uh, you know, for uh, pain and intractable brain disorders like uh, epilepsy, uh, it looks like there's just genuinely a high degree of, of hope and optimism that these technologies can be applied to actually produce uh, near cures for many of these, uh, these conditions. I guess one last one I'll throw out there. This was a complete surprise to me because there was a family member uh, that I uh, very close to who uh, was diagnosed with MS. And I've gotten pretty close to the research community in the MS uh, areas. And one of the discoveries that just blew me away was that there's a direct connection between the bacteria in your gut and the conditions that are manifest for uh, multiple sclerosis in your brain. You know, it's, it's interesting. And, and that's something that Ian and Vivian ended up talking about a bit in their South by Southwest talk. Uh, so I think for folks watching, go check that out. The other thing that struck me and, and Mark, this kind of came to mind as you were speaking, is not necessarily neuroscience, but something that's really become maybe more popularized or the research has become more available is around epigenetics and the impact of people's experiences on their actual um, genes. So I think we're starting to understand more about that. I know Ian, you've brought this up in conversations in the past, just talking about epigenetics, but like there's stuff that, that touches on this and touches on some of the studies she represents in the book, but that weren't necessarily um, available 13, 14 years ago. Um, well, for me, I think that the author's main conclusion that the brain can improve, change, and transform even late in life, it now feels somewhat obvious because of the research that's been done and how much further we've come. So in reading this book, I didn't need to be convinced. And I think if I had read it in 2007, I would have needed a different level of convincing. Yeah, I'd echo that. I, I think um, actually most of the book almost felt like, and I know I'm obviously biased having uh, been in neuroscience for a long time. But most of the book actually really did kind of feel like it was very basic information that I really knew. Um, the, the idea that neuroplasticity can determine so much of your life is really fundamental to how I actually live now with the, the benefit of the information that I've gleaned in the last five to 10 years from neuroscience. Um, I think some of the stuff that's really interesting that's happened since has been to go beyond that and to actually try and figure out why um, why neuroplasticity occurs and how it actually pro propagates and um, affects the physiology, the chemistry of the brain. Um, and then also some of the um, tools that we can use, including what Hum is building, to actually cause it to uh, more rapidly occur. One of the really interesting things that I've seen in the last five years has been this um, explosion in digital medicine. And I know that um, a lot of people who are familiar with Hum will be familiar with the work of Dr. Adam Gazelli and the Neuroscape Lab at UCSF. Um, that lab obviously has had some um, 
some uh, commercialization efforts for a long time now that uh, actually resulted in what I think is the first FDA approved um, non-drug treatment for ADHD. And the idea that you can use a computer game and have someone sit down, measure their biometrics and measure their performance in a computer game and increase neuroplasticity drastically um, just by getting them to play the game in a way that can actually overcome um, challenges, things like ADHD is pretty incredible. And I think we're at a, a really different level of understanding even just five years later um, since the publishing of this book beyond the point where we're amazed that neuroplasticity exists, but now at the point where we can build things like um, what Neuroscape built and what HUM is building that actually cause neuroplasticity. What were you taught about the brain, right? Because that's changed. Like, as you said, Brie, maybe if you'd read this when it came out, you would have taken more convincing. But what has had to change in your understanding of the brain? as you've grown, not necessarily from this book, but just in it's life. Kind of, it's kind of interesting, you know, being one of the older members of the crew here. Um, I remember when I was a kid, you know, people basically think that your brain is very elastic and adaptive when you're young and when you're developing. And then by the time you reach your mid to late teens, early 20s, that's kind of over and you are who you are and it works the way it works. And, uh, and I don't think you could be much more wrong than that. Uh, it, it's you know been proven out in a lot of different ways, many of them illuminated in this book, that, that neuroplasticity and adaptability of the brain is a fundamental trait of it. it, it you're right up through you know your elder years. Uh, it manifests itself in different ways, maybe the level of effort necessary to get it to be more elastic or adaptable changes, but the, the fundamental trait is always there, right? Yeah. Well, um, for me, I, you know, I think I had always felt there was a somewhat of a split between nature and nurture. And this book sort of changed my opinion on that a little bit and leaning towards nurture being the more important part. And this just struck me in the rat experiment where they where the rats were either a, a nurturing mother rat or a non nurturing mother rat and how the babies turned out. And then when they took babies that were kind of fostered by the individual rats, it switched how they turned out as parents. Um, and it's specifically relevant to me because I plan to foster to adopt. And so I think about how I can impact a child, even if they don't have my genetics, and that nature will nurture will play a greater role than nature in that case. So that was somewhat comforting and a good thing to read about for me. change directions a little bit. One thing that I loved about this book was just the fact that, you know, she starts and she's telling the story of like how um, the Dalai Lama and, and all of these different neuroscientists came together to really examine these questions. And, and at, at the old end of the day, probably largely around consciousness, mind, you know, um, the brain in general. But I would love to know if you had any two groups of people that you could bring together to, to hold some sort of event, who would you bring together? I do have a thought about this. Um, and this is actually largely influenced by um, a book I read called Extreme Ownership. And it really talks about Navy SEALs training, like intense Navy SEALs training, um, and directly relating with neuroscience and how much they actually influence each other. And I think that Typically, maybe more traditionally, we'd think of, you know, physical training, group efforts, um, tactical strategy, uh, and all of that sort of thing. Um, but what's come out more recently is the idea of the, the, the flow state, which I'm sure we've all heard before. And that's really something that is completely guided by the efforts of, of neuroscience um, and helping these very elite teams perform at their best as one complete unit, right? And so, so I, I think that, you know, that whole field of high-performing uh, you know, uh, people, whether that's athletes, whether that's Navy SEALs, I think that to me is a really interesting crossover between, you know, what we previously thought of as like a static brain. Um, the two I'd like to see spending more time together would be, uh, you know, behavioral neuroscientists and teachers, because yeah. the way we teach our children and the way, you know, it's believed that knowledge is assimilated and a cognition is founded inside the developing brain. You know, I, I think maybe a lot of the assumptions we make are old and stale and need to be revisited uh, based on a lot of the types of uh, information in this book. You know, the, the people don't learn the same way. People don't adapt at the same rate. People, yet they may, their, their endpoints may be very similar. But if you're not sensitive to 
the, the individual nature of your neuroplasticity, not just all neuroplasticity. Uh, you know, there may be a better way to teach kids if you uh, are cognizant of that, right? Yeah, I, I echo what you say, Mark. I think it's a really fantastic thought and it's one that I've, I've often had having been privileged to have seen um, the progress of Dr. Zanta's and, and Dr. Gazelli's work, um, as well as having gone to conferences uh, about mental performance from groups like high performance esports athletes, fighter pilots, um, and just like really different um, activities that people are doing, but um, to see how they're applying the latest in understanding of how people learn and how people perform mentally. And then to think about how those things could really make a massive difference to education. I think we're, we're at a really rudimentary um, level in, in our education. Honestly, I, I mean, that kind of sounds like a very blanket um, inflammatory statement, but um, when you think about it, the, the, the way that an individual brain works, the way that one child brain is developed as, as opposed to another's, um, the way that different people with different neuro conditions that are like non-optimal um, respond to different stimuli. There are so many factors that we don't adjust and personalize education for. If you think about education in general, the way it works in most venues these days is we kind of teach to the median. And, you know, what you and I are both sort of alluding to is a, 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 an age where we start to teach to the individual. Early in the book, she talks about phrenology, and there's actually a couple places where she brings up debunked sciences and talks about what people could take from it. And I thought what was interesting with phrenology, she's like, well, here's the stuff that obviously doesn't make sense, but here's what people took from it. And, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot to be gained by looking at maybe things that are not scientific in terms of like, well, what is somebody, what is the question somebody is trying to answer and how do we go get that? So I'm curious of like, if there's like a debunked science or something that you think is really out there that may have a lesson for us that we can bring into um, neuroscience in some way. Yeah, I, I constantly am running into um, people who do kind of high performance coaching for executives and um, just like life coaches and things in general. It's been a, a bit of a passion of mine in these last 12 months uh, at the same time as COVID and things have been developing. Um, and, you know, I read a lot of books about growth mindset and success mindsets and things like this. I think there's a lot of what I, what I think in California we call woo woo or like just, you know, pseudoscience um, that actually while it doesn't have grounds in science, has a lot of effect and a lot of benefit for people. And, and just some of the things that I've seen that are just massive movements that are, it's easy to sneer at because they're not grounded in, in hard science, um, are, but, but, I, but I think it may have some merit that may need to be more closely studied. Uh, things like um, the manifestation concept. I, I know we've all heard and laughed at the secret idea where you can just like focus on something and think about it and, and, and in some way it'll come to you. I think um, some of those kinds of ideas of, of being able to imagine something and focus on something, th there must be psychological and neuroscientific mechanisms underlying why those things do work for so many people. There's a lot to be interested in about how these kinds of accepted practices amongst certain groups of people that are not accepted by traditional science may have merits or something to, to implicate for what we should be looking at in science. I think there's an important delineation to add to that as well, which is, you know, so everything you just said, Ian, but there's an additional dimension, which is cases where there are attributes or, or areas of science or behavioral uh, sciences that we don't understand the linkage yet, yet the linkage is still there. Um, for example, you know, when I mentioned earlier the, the gut to brain link for the, the uh, manifestations of some MS uh, progression attributes, right? Uh, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, people would have probably been laughed at if they, they had suggested that what you ate and the flora in your, in, in your intestines had a first order effect on the progression, disease progression of something like MS. Yeah, I think when Ian brought up um, the law of attraction and manifestation, I think a few years back when I was thinking about it, I was like, 
oh, like, I don't really understand how that works. It seems like voodoo and magic, and I don't really get that. But I think what does make a lot of sense is the idea that you can have this vision for yourself and these goals that you want to achieve. And later down the line, that's something that you can keep in mind. So personally, um, senior year, when I graduated from high school, I looked back at this list of goals that I had for myself freshman year. And I realized that I ended up checking off all those boxes, even though I didn't constantly have that list in front of me. So I think that idea of having a vision and having some sort of thing that you're working towards is really important. Um, you know, I think the area of mindsets is actually really, really fascinating because um, the fundamental concept that underlies it is just that 90% of our behavior is, is almost autonomous in that the way that we do it is set by our pre-existing mindsets because we just don't have the, the ability to, to bring our full conscious effort to everything we do. We often, 90% of the time anyway, bring a uh, kind of like a learned approach. And a lot of those learned approaches are things like um, how as a child you learned to negotiate or how in the last couple of years you've learned to position yourself professionally. Those kinds of things are really grounded in, in, in what I think is a developing science of mindsets. One of, the, one of my favorite stories is early on the book, she starts talking about Gage and like his summer internship and how he wasn't even going to be a scientist and he ends up in this summer internship where it's like, okay, I kind of like this. And it ended up being this really nodal moment in his life. So I'm curious for you to share, like, is there a nodal moment in your life that changed things or changed the trajectory of what you were doing? I don't want to sound like a broken record, but, you know, having uh, someone close to you uh, get diagnosed with a, a neurodegenerative disease like MS, was, I mean, it, you know, it, it wasn't a happy thing, but it, it was like a big wake up call and it pretty much changed my trajectory because suddenly now I was very interested and very focused on trying to figure out what's going on here. And it was really the beginning of a pretty big change in both my professional and personal life that's, uh, you know, taken me to where, where I am now. So Yeah, I have a yeah, it's somewhat of a, of a nodal moment, um, which relates to this, this book actually, is that when I was about 21, my dad and I both kind of got into meditation. I noticed he was doing it a lot. Um, and I decided to give it a shot. And I didn't know a whole lot about Buddhism or even at the time understand much of the history and the reasons why people did it. Um, but for me, it was definitely like a door open into the mind. And I was, I began to have experiences like greater clarity, um, sort of being able to be more in the moment, but also kind of realizing that my, my mind or this, uh, this concept of a mind that was expanding to me um, was actually able to help me solve problems that had been nagging at me for a little while. Um, and so, you know, I, I think particularly when, when my journey with HUM began, the, the influence there was really largely from meditation and just realizing that there is still so much that we don't know, both technically um, and neurophysically what's going on in the brain, but that those things are still very influential and very powerful and can really be the difference between your mind being calm and you being stressed and anxious, or you being confident and capable and, and happy. I'll share one. Mine is not as prosaic as, as uh, Andy's or, or Mark's, but uh, I met a guy and he literally was like, you need to read this book and you will move to the Bay Area and you will work in technology. And he literally gave me Neil, Neil um, Stevenson's The Diamond Age, um, or actually, no, I think it was Snow Crash. And I read it and I was like, hell yeah, I'm moving to California. So like, if he hadn't given me that book and told me that I would move after I read it and come work in technology, I don't know that I would have. So sometimes those are nodal moments that you don't recognize at the moment, um, but they end up being really foundational to like the rest of your life. <laughs> A lot of what happens in this book is challenging notions of what it means to do neuroscience or challenging notions of like who should be the gatekeepers in that industry. So I'm curious about a piece of dogma in your, in your particular discipline or maybe within the world we live in that you think um, should be challenged or challenged. I, I have one. Um, so um, I have a somewhat of a background in nonprofit fundraising. And there's this idea, and it seems to carry through for a lot of foundations, that 
Funding should be restricted to specific items or specific buckets for the nonprofits. And often that means there's very little operational support. So what that can translate into is you get a $10,000 grant, but you can only spend it on books for the children. You cannot spend it to hire a volunteer coordinator to get tutors to read the books to the children. Um, it's something that's starting to be pushed back against. Um, and I think it translates into grants as well. A lot of grants are very restrictive, highly specific. You can only spend money in certain ways. And it's so restrictive that it makes it hard for there to be as big of an impact as there could be if they just did incredible due diligence and then trusted the organization or entity with the money. So, Well, and I think it's fascinating that that was what um, Mackenzie Scott did with her fortune this year. I mean, she what funded like 75% of the COVID um, COVID, uh, you know, COVID uh, philanthropy in the past year, but basically she did all this research, right? And donated money and did it no strings attached. Well, I mean, the, the one I would throw out there is a little bit more fundamental. And I think- Oh, Mark, you just- A little bit easier to dispel these days, but I, I still think there's a general belief, uh, especially many people who are outside the neuroscience community uh, and, and maybe high tech that, that as people become adults, they just don't change. You know, they, they, they maybe can put on airs, they behave differently, but at their core, their personality, their psychology, the way they process and think is fundamentally rigid. And, uh, you know, to me, that's in my own life and the many people that I know and care about is just not the case. It, it almost helps to think of the mind, uh, trying to think of a metaphor here, um, Kind of like it, like a tree, right? Or something, something that grows. It's not like a tree just grows for the first part of its life, then gets old and deteriorates and dies. But it's always, you know, sending new roots out. It's always growing new leaves and whatnot. And maybe to to push this analogy a bit too far, but often the oldest trees are the most resilient. They're they're the largest. They're the wisest. And so I think it helps to think of the brain in in that kind of way, um, where yes, the, the growth might slow, but it's always there, it's always changing to an, a, a different adapting environment. The greatest implication of the discovery of neuroplasticity to me was just the idea that, I mean, it, it's most related to growth mindset, but I think in general, just change in life. Um, it is possible. And people really do have the ability to determine their own circumstances as much as some people are more privileged than others and some people are more lucky and, and we can't control everything that happens to us and we'll never be able to change that. There is, uh, I think, just a, a large group of people in society who haven't had the benefit of a lot of education, who think they never could go to college, that kind of thing. But also there are, there are people who are trapped in professions that they studied for many years to do, like law um, and medicine, that they don't feel necessarily very passionate about, that they're afraid to leave. Um, I think like we're very lucky in this group here, um, having had the life experiences we have and, and being able to work on a startup and, and basically being challenged and, and privileged every day to be able to learn new things um, and see the potential for that to, to, to continue over our lives. But I think a lot of people really haven't either heard that or really processed it yet. Um, and so I think that like happiness will come um, in, in large part from the ability of people to, to really process the implications of neuroplasticity. Thank you so much for coming to the first Hum Book Club. Mm -hmm.